All right, welcome everyone to TAM Lab number 78. Uh, today I'm gonna to be going through a whole bunch of scenarios and some hands-on stuff, which hopefully will outline the process to migrate VMs with RDMs and convert RDMs to VMDKs. So that is the plan. And from an agenda perspective, um, here's what we're gonna cover. So we'll just kind of talk briefly about what RDMs are, how you use them, why you would use them, right? What, what's the use case around those? Um, then we'll get into really more hands-on stuff as far as migrating VMs and moving them and then how we actually convert RDMs to VMDKs. And I put Q&A at the end here, but again, feel free to unmute yourself if you've got questions or comments or uh, put it in the chat, we'll be monitoring that as well. And then my last slide before we jump in here, completely unrelated to our lab here today, I just wanted to call this out. Um, if you're not aware, Adobe Flash Player is going end of life at the end of this year, which is 20, 2020, so December 31st. And there are some potential impacts to some VMware products. Uh, the, the biggest one probably being vCenter. So if you're on an older version of vCenter and you're using the web client, Flash will no longer work, right? So you're gonna be in, in some trouble there. Horizon also, the, the admin console. Um, and then some vCloud Director and NSXV. We're looking for other things that could potentially be impacted, but these are the four we're aware of right now. So if this is new to you, please reach out to your TAM and make sure you have a plan in place to um, cover your bases here. All right, so let me stop my PowerPoint and we're gonna jump right in here. So number one, what are RDMs um, and maybe as I'm talking here, if you wanna raise your hand from a participant perspective, if you don't know what RDMs are, uh, that might help. But I'm, I'm pretty sure most folks know what an RDM is these days, right? So an RDM is a raw device mapping. And basically what that means is you've got a lot of VMs in your environment. Uh, an RDM is basically a raw LUN presented from uh, an underlying hardware storage array that is presented directly to the VM, right? So it, it's bypassing um, the VMFS virtualization layer, so to speak, and it's kind of uh, directly mapped into a virtual machine. Um, there are some use cases for that. And it used to be back in the day, you know, um, the claim was RDMs are faster than VMFS, than a VMDK on VMFS. But today, um, the performance is pretty much the same. Uh, I've even heard arguments where VMDKs are faster. So that argument is out the door. The other real big one is um, particularly with Microsoft clustering, right? Because they need SCSI 3 reservations to do the Windows failover clustering. And that's where RDMs tra traditionally come into play, right? However, with, with vSphere 7, we now have the ability to do SCSI 3 reservations within VMFS uh, with traditional VMDKs. So that argument is kind of going away. There are some dependencies as far as using that technology on the storage array side, and of course being on vSphere 7 with all of your hosts at seven or above. Um, so you may not be there yet, but just know that you may not need to be using RDMs anymore. And um, also, if I can interrupt yeah, just for a second. Go ahead. Um, a lot of the complications that are going to be discussed in the rest of this uh, meeting are also relevant if somebody has presented an iSCSI LUN directly to a guest operating system or an NFS share directly to a guest operating system. The fix for it may be different. So, for example, you might not actually want to create a VMDK and migrate that data uh, from an iSCSI target or or an NFS share to a VMDK. But uh, in terms of lifting a VM from one environment and moving it to another, you certainly can run into many of the same problems uh, in terms of, of latency and bandwidth and you know, data charges if we're talking about egress from Amazon or Microsoft's clouds. Uh, and so keep in mind that while we're talking about RDMs today, uh, iSCSI, uh, LUNs and NFS shares presented directly to a guest operating system are, are going to be similar to you in terms of impact. Yes, good call. Um, let's see, the other two use cases I can think of are if you have a VM that's running an application and it needs direct access to the underlying storage array for whatever reason, maybe there's some SAN specific tools, right? And it needs that direct access. That is one use case. 
I don't see that very often. I don't know if I've ever seen that, honestly. Um, but that that is a use case you could potentially leverage via an RDM for. The other one, and I, again, I don't see this very often anymore either, is uh, when you're using VMware Converter and you're, you're P2Ving you know, a physical server and you may just want to attach the majority of the, the data uh, through an RDM and it would prevent having to you know, have a long wait time as you're converting that. So uh, definitely some, some use cases there, but primarily I definitely try to steer my customers away from using RDMs. They're complex. There's a lot of caveats with them. And uh, from a visibility perspective, it, it's difficult to keep an eye on really what's happening in your virtual environment from a storage perspective. So hopefully that makes sense uh, as far as what is an RDM, right? And, and some of the reasons why you would use it. Um, as far as creating them, let's actually do that here. So I am using iSCSI. I'm sorry to say I don't have fiber channel in my lab. Uh, probably a good thing. It'd be a little expensive and hot, but so I do have a FreeNAS uh, iSCSI server here. So I'm just going to create a couple iSCSI RDM LUNs here. I'll just use the wizard to make it fast. So I'm just going to do, I'm going to create three LUNs and there'll be five gig, six gig, and seven gig just to make it simple. And again, depending on what storage you're using here, it, it could be vastly different, right? I'll make this five gig. Next, tie it to my portal. Next. Uh, I'm not going to get fancy as far as uh, doing like LUN masking or restricting it to certain networks. Definitely not a best practice, but uh, this is just to kind of get us going here quickly. So this one will be six, six gigs. So this is why you don't want to use RDMs. It's a pain in the butt, right? You got to go work with your storage team, create these LUNs, then you've got to do your zoning uh, for all the hosts in the cluster. So it's just a lot. It's a big headache. And this was seven gigs, right? All right. So now that I've got those created, if we go back to our cluster here, I've only got two hosts, but you would probably have to do this in, you know, against all of your hosts. Uh, you're gonna come in, again, this is iSCSI, but you may have fiber channel HBAs that you would have to rescan, right? So if we rescan these, we should see three additional LUNs here. So we got our five, six, and seven. I'm gonna do the same on my other host. All right. So that was relatively easy, but that's because it's a lab and I have control over everything. In, in an enterprise, this would take probably a couple days, right? You got to work with the storage team, provision the LUNs, get it zoned up, make sure everything is, is visible across your entire cluster, right? So now we can actually start attaching these LUNs directly to some VMs. So one thing I do want to call out though, if you are using RDMs, right, you've, you've got those use cases, um, the one thing you're going to want to do is mark those LUNs as perennially reserved because what that does is when a, when a host reboots, if this host reboots, it's going to see all those LUNs that it has access to, and it's going to try and scan all of those LUNs to see if it's got VMFS on it, right? And because of usually the SCSI 3 reservations that Microsoft is using for its clustering, it can't access it, so it has to sit there and time out. And if you've got a bunch of the RDMs in your environment, it's gonna take, I've seen with one of my customers up to about eight hours for one of their hosts to reboot, which was painful, right? It should never be that long. So what you wanna do is there's a command you can enter, a command line, or I think you can use Power CLI. Um, I have the, the KB, I'll put it in the, uh, the notes below here in the video. But uh, you have to enter a command to mark that LUN as perennially reserved for every host in your cluster. So that can be pretty tedious. The great thing with vSphere 7 is, which I just discovered actually, let's say this one here I know is an RDM. I have the ability to mark it as perennially reserved and I can apply it to every host in the cluster. So that's a huge time saver and something I, I wasn't aware of with, with vSphere 7. So, 
Um, pretty nice little feature that they've added in there. So be sure to do that. And again, if you're adding more hosts to the cluster, you can just go into those new hosts and mark them appropriately. So this, this should be a pretty good time saver for you if you're used to scripting this out. All right, so let's see. Let's go to this VM here. This one is actually running Windows and I'm gonna show you the process to attach an RDM. So we're gonna go edit settings. It doesn't need to be powered off the VM. Uh, you can do this while it's running. Just like adding a regular hard drive, you're gonna add an RDM disk. And then you should in theory see all of your LUNs, right, that are available. So it's not gonna show LUNs that have been consumed by another RDM, right, that's already attached to another VM or your VMFS data stores either. So these are just unclaimed uh, LUNs at this point, right? The thing to uh, keep in mind when you're trying to figure out which one is which, uh, obviously the size is gonna be a, a dead giveaway, but if you've got multiple RDM LUNs that are the same size, you're gonna wanna go by this NAA number, and that is a network address authority number, which is in theory globally unique for any LUNs, right? So that's gonna be the, the number that you kinda of wanna use as your source of truth, right? So for this one, I'm just gonna pick our five gig one. We'll click okay. And we have a couple options as far as the type of RDM. So there are two flavors. There's physical mode and then there's virtual mode. So physical mode means that the SCSI commands are gonna go directly to that LUN, right? They're not gonna have any kind of interaction with VMFS whatsoever. Um, it's good when you're doing SAN aware applications, things like that, uh, but there's definitely some limitations there as well. If we do virtual, the biggest thing with virtual is that snapshots will now work, whereas with physical, they won't. So those are the kind of the two main differences between the two. Um, for a Microsoft cluster, you're gonna to wanna to choose physical compatibility mode. And there's a lot of documentation out there that kind of supports that. I did a SQL Server clustering TAM lab a couple months ago. Um, I'll put the link in here somewhere. Uh, check that out. It kind of covers all of the, that setup that's required there. All right, so let's just do physical. That is the default, by the way. And we'll click okay. So it's as simple as that, right? Not too difficult once you have the LUNS provision. So if we actually log into this VM here. And we go to our computer management. We should see this as an available disk. So now it's just like Windows, right? You're gonna need to uh, initialize that disk, bring it online, format it, and you're off and running, right? Whatever, that's fine. And there's my new volume, right? So I should be able to, as a test, just create a new folder. And that just kind of validates you can actually write to it, right? You can create data in here, no problem. So that's pretty much it from a, you know, connecting uh, an RDM to a particular VM. So let me show this one thing. Um, if you need to remove this RDM for whatever reason, and there are some reasons why you'd wanna do that, you're just gonna to want to go into the config, delete it, and there's no harm in deleting these files from the data store because what it's actually done underneath the covers is there is a VMDK associated with this RDM, but it's really just a pointer file. So there's it's no the actual data in there. Exactly. So it's just telling uh, the VM which LUN to actually go talk to, right? So it's there's really no harm in deleting it. In fact, you should, because otherwise you're gonna have all these descriptor VMDK files left around in your environment. So we delete that, it goes away. Uh, okay, my disk is gone, that's no good. But we can always just go back in and re-add it. And we're gonna do an RDM again, pick our five gig one, boom. There it is, it's right back, right? And it should have the data still in there should have persisted and it has so there you go so pretty straightforward um, i'm going to add 
the other two RDMs that we created to these other two VMs here. So these do not have an operating system because I wanted to move them around and I don't have to worry about um, you know, actually copying data so it'll go faster. So let's take Testo1 and let's add our six gig RDM to this guy. And we will do physical for this one. So we'll leave it as default physical. Very good. And then on 02, we'll do the same thing with this one, we'll make virtual. So this is the seven gig RDM. And we'll make it virtual. And then once you do choose virtual, you have a couple other options uh, as far as disk mode. Again, these are the same as you would normally have with a regular VMDK. So dependent meaning that the the VMDK is included in snapshot operations. Um, independent means it's excluded from snapshot operations, but the data will persist. And then independent non-persistent means it's excluded from snapshots and the data will not persist after reboots, which is kind of nice for like a kiosk type scenario, I guess, right? So I'm gonna leave it as independent persistent doesn't really matter here. Uh, again, this little icon kind of tells you what those three options mean again. But for our sake, really, it's not critical. All right, so we've got those two added. So let's move some of these things around. So this is kind of really the bulk of the lab here. And again, I'm, I don't feel super prepared today because it was, uh, it's been a busy week. But um, I think we'll just be able to kind of run through some scenarios as far as what is possible and is not possible as far as moving these things around and how you can migrate uh, the actual data from an RDM into a VMDK. So there are a ton of uh, scenarios that we could go through because there's so many parameters here, right? So if there's something you want to specifically see and try, let me know, we can, we can try it out, right? So first off, just so everyone's aware, I can absolutely vMotion these VMs around, no problem. And I'm not talking storage vMotion, I'm just talking regular vMotion, right? So this one is currently on number four. Let's move it to three, right? No problem. Same with number two. This is a virtual RDM. And you happen to be on four, let's move it to three. I think I have a DRS rule, so it's gonna try and separate these, but it should still let me do it. So regular vMotion works just fine, no worries there. You won't have any problems with DRS. Um, you should be good to go. Storage vMotion is a much different story. It's, it's a complex answer. So if someone asks you, can I storage vMotion a VM with an RDM disk? Uh, the answer will pretty much always be it depends because again of all these different scenarios we could have so you could have an RDM that's physical that's virtual if it's virtual there's different disk modes um, are you moving it from VMFS to vSAN I mean there's just a lot of different scenarios here so number one let's do our test 01 which is a physical RDM right and it's on VMFS 01 so let's migrate that we're just gonna do storage, so storage vMotion. And let's put it on, where was I? I'm on 01, so let's try to move it to 02. So keep note, I did not touch this up here, right? We're just gonna keep the same format. Click next, finish, and it should complete just fine. So now it's on 02. So check, we can move uh, a VM with a physical RDM, storage vMotion. So let's try to put it back. So I'm on two, let's put it to one, but this time let's change this source, right? So let's choose thin provision. It's not gonna let me do it because basically when you change anything up here, when you choose thick or thin, that's when it's going to try to convert this RDM uh, and pull all of the data out of the RDM and put it into a VMDK. So that's essentially your option for converting an RDM to a VMDK, which we can't do that with a physical RDM, not when the VM is powered on anyway. So I know there's a lot of things going on here, but um, if I were to choose, put it back on one without changing the source, again, it's just fine. So it's gonna remain an RDM. 
So let's put it back, check. And if we look at it, you can see this is still an RDM and you can tell it's still an RDM because of this physical one. And so if you click on that, actually, it will show you that NAA number that we were talking about earlier. So if for whatever reason you need to detach an RDM, right, and you want to definitely jot down, okay, which RDM is which and in what order do you want them assigned and on what SCSI adapter, that's what you want to take note of is this NAA number. So just be aware of that. So TESTO2, again, this one is a virtual RDM. Let's migrate this. So it's currently on BMFS02. Uh, I can move it to one, that will work, no problem. Uh, and here's the, here's the secret sauce with a virtual RDM is now you can change this to a thin provision, for instance. And if I click finish, it's gonna take a little bit longer. And that's because it's actually converting all the data within that RDM into a VMDK. So that's a good thing, but it's also not very descriptive, right? It, it, we know nothing ever said, okay, this is what's gonna happen when you click finish here. So I had a customer not too long ago, a couple months ago, that actually was just not intending to convert their RDMs and they just wanted to move it and they ended up converting it and then didn't really realize that had happened. Um, something else went wrong and it didn't work out. I think it was because it was a shared disk and they ended up having to call support and be like, what's going on, right? And come to find out it had converted the RDM to a VMDK without, that was not their intention, right? Can you talk about the contents of the iSCSI line when that's done? Yes, good call. You knew right where I was going. So we'll let this finish. All right, so now if we look at it, looks a little different, right? It doesn't point to a physical LUN. It looks like a traditional VMDK. In fact, it specifically says it is a VMDK, right? And it's got a, this funky size associated with it because it was looking at the actual number of blocks, right? So it is indeed now a VMDK which means your RDM is still sitting out there with data on it and it's now static, right? So if this VM actually had a, an operating system and I was in there writing data to this disk, it's now writing data to the VMDK and not the RDM. So you've now got like the split brain scenario. So let's say I did that, I didn't intend to do it. What I can always do here is delete this and this is an actual VMDK. So deleting files from data store does actually mean a lot more now. It's actually going to delete that VMDK. So we'll delete it. And we should be able to add this RDM back. There you go. I can re-add this RDM. And take note, I can actually change the compatibility mode, mode here, right? It doesn't have to be physical just because I did it physical once, or I guess it was virtual actually. So I can change that. And that's actually a good thing because if you want to migrate an, an RDM to a VMDK, but not shut the VM down, then it needs to be in this virtual mode. So what you could do if it was attached in physical mode is you could detach it, reattach it as virtual. Uh, just be aware that there's probably gonna be some kind of a, a slight outage there as you've removed disks from your VM and now re-added them, right? So if there's an application there, you'd probably wanna shut down the VM as you do that. But then you could bring it back up and it would be in virtual mode, and then you could convert it to a, a VMDK as it's running without having any downtime, right? And implicitly in, in the scenario that, that you just shared, if the customer managed to inadvertently convert an RDM to a VMDK and didn't notice for a while, the fix would probably not be as simple as what was just shared. They would probably need to deal with uh, changes to data and making sure that the data that was changed gets updated on the iSCSI LUN. Yeah, that's a good point. Like if you had left it there for a while and now you've got, like I said, that split brain, what you could do is reattach the original RDM and your OS would see the two disks and you could use some kind of a, a tool within the guest to kind of sync up that data and then you would remove that VMDK. Um, that's an ugly scenario and something you would probably want to avoid at all costs. 
Um, but again, if you've converted an RDM to a VMDK and you didn't even realize it, you might want to just ask the question, well, maybe it can just stay an R or a VM VMDK, right? Maybe there's not a reason for it to be an RDM if it was just a regular disk and you're not doing any Microsoft clustering or things like that, right? Yeah, the only the only way that that would work is if you did a mirror. You'd have to mirror the uh, the underlying disk to the back to the RDM. So that would be within the guest. Yes. Oh, I got you. Yep, it'd be messy for sure. Uh, it would be pretty ugly. <laughs> All right, especially uh, if you had like a hundred disks. Oh, I've seen that too. Pretty crazy. Um, all right, so let's move on. Let's do, I'm going to remove, and bear with me here as I kind of clean this up a bit. So I'm going to remove this RDM. And while you're cleaning things up, can, can we do a quick uh, uh, poll here and have people raise their hands? Is there anybody who didn't understand the distinction between presenting an iSCSI LUN uh, by way of an RDM to the guest versus presenting that same iSCSI LUN directly to the guest because those are two different things. And I, I brought that up earlier that the impact is kind of similar, but the process is very different and your ability to notice one versus the other is very different. So I'm kind of curious to see if, if people uh, understand that difference. So when you say that, Zach, you're referring to kind of attaching the LUN directly to the guest through Indeed. like the iSCSI initiator, right? Not Indeed. even going through, yeah. Correct, or, or just a map network drive. I mean, anything that you can do at the guest OS level that the virtualized hardware doesn't know has happened is what I'm talking about. Yeah, so if, if you were to do this, like Zach says, you're, where you're connecting this LUN directly to the guest OS via the iSCSI initiator, you've now completely bypassed any concept of that All storage. of these effectively has been bypassed. Exactly. And you don't have to zone your hosts for that RDM or that LUN. You can zone directly to just the guest itself. You know, you've got an IQ in here. And or similarly with NFS, right? You're just now connecting over the network. Yeah, and, and just to clarify, this is not at all Steve or me advocating that anybody <laughs> should actually do this. In fact, I think probably in almost no case should somebody do this. Uh, if this happens, its presentation is really goofy. So for example, because VMware tools queries for disk information at the guest OS level, anything that is pulled using VMware tools is going to see these disks. Whereas if you're just looking at VMDKs on a, a data store somewhere, you wouldn't actually know that any of these uh, uh, disks exist on the VM. And again, that's that's where picking up a, a VM and moving it from one data center to another or to the cloud is negatively impacted by these kinds of arrangements. Um, I don't know that I have a, a particularly effective way to tell people to scan for this proactively, but it's it's definitely a conversation you'd want to have with, with your customers, or if you are a customer, it'd be a good conversation to have with your, with your TAMs. Um, as you're planning migration waves, any VMs that have RDMs, any VMs that have uh, NFS or, or iSCSI disks that are configured at the guest OS level, those I think you'd want to categorize as difficult and and probably not add to your first wave of migrations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you may be able to identify some of these things, right? The ones that are mapped directly in the guest, which I'm hoping there are very small amounts of these, but uh, like iSCSI is I think port 3260, so you could somehow do some querying for that over the network. Yeah. NFS, you know, same thing. Yeah, very um, much. I, I can't find where that port is. Anyway, I'm pretty sure it's 3260. And then the other thing that you would have to do, which is another reason why this is a very complex situation, is within vSphere, you would probably want to create a port group for iSCSI. You're going to have another NIC attached to this VM for iSCSI traffic, right? There's, there's a lot. There's a lot of complexity there, so... Yeah, I mean, in effect, I don't, I don't think most vSphere operations teams would do it on purpose. I think it would probably be the result of a rogue VM owner doing it without the vSphere ops team knowing it happened. Yeah, nowadays. I, honestly, I can remember doing this 15 years ago. 
because we thought it was better performance if it was mapped directly into the VM. <laughs> but that was like 3.5 days, so I haven't done it in yeah, a very long time, and it was complex, so. Yeah, sorry, I'm done steering you. Away no, 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 I appreciate it, I appreciate it, because I'm struggling to uh, stay focused here. All right, so let's do this. Let's connect one RDM to both of these VMs and then play around with it that way, right? So this would be more of a scenario where you have a Microsoft cluster, for instance, where you're sharing RDM disks for one quorum and then two for the data, right? Whether that's a file server or a SQL server, things like that. So number one, before I do anything, is I'm going to add a new SCSI controller to each of these. And uh, usually, VMware Para Virtual is what you want to use, not in all cases, so definitely do your homework as far as requirements from a guest OS perspective. And then the SCSI bus sharing, you're going to want to do physical. So we'll add that to one. We'll add that to two here. Boom, boom. All right. So now we should be able to go into test 01. Let's add a new device. We're going to pick RDM. Let's just pick the six gig here. And let's keep it physical. Uh, I'm not going to use the multi writer. You may want to do that for some Linux workloads. Uh, but for Microsoft clustering, just leave it as unspecified, which will default to no sharing. So I know it, it sounds like, well, I would want multi writer, but um, because we did the SCSI adapter as physical, and again, we're doing the SCSI three reservations, just leave it as no sharing. Uh, so we'll leave it as physical, but again, we're going to change the controller to SCSI controller one. So we'll click OK. And let's look at it one more time so we can see our, our RDM here. It looks good. So now the way you would connect number two to that same RDM, it's going to be a little bit different. So you're going to go in again, add new device, but this time we'll choose an existing hard disk, not an RDM disk. Because if we do RDM disk, we don't see that six gig LUN here because it's already been attached to a different VM, right? So we're going to do existing hard disk. We're going to browse to the files and I have no idea where test01 is. Oh, I got lucky here. So if we browse to the files of test01, you can see the secondary VMDK here. Again, this is not a real VMDK. It's just a descriptor file. It points to that LUN, and you can kind of validate that by the size here, right? So it's six gigs. So we'll click OK. Uh, some of this will be already uh, chosen for us because it's already in physical compatibility mode with test01, so we don't even get a choice here to, to change that. Uh, we just want to make sure that the controller matches uh, that's especially important for SQL and Microsoft clustering, right? You want to make sure that the SCSI controller and device match and align. So we'll click OK. And hopefully that should work. All right, so now they're both connected to this one particular RDM. Life is good. You've got your application running on these. Um, you're probably going to want to set up some DRS rules so that these VMs um, are not running on the same host potentially if you're doing cluster, what is it, cluster outside a box. Um, and then if we look at the storage actually, oops, files, you can see, well, they're both running here. Testo2 just has the one VMDK, right? This is its main VMDK. If we look at Testo1, it should have two of them which is its main VMDK plus that RDM descriptor file, which is right here. And it looks like it's six gigs, but it's not really six gigs. It's just a, it's just a pointer. All right, so let's see. How would we move these, right? So again, you can vMotion these all day, regular vMotion, no problem, shouldn't, shouldn't be an issue. But if you wanted to storage migrate these things to a different LUN, what would you do? Let's say we wanted to move test01 from VMFS01 to VMFS02. Well, because they're using that shared disk, I don't think you're going to be able to do it here. So if we go migrate, change it, and I think it's actually because of this, the 
because of the SCSI controller, right? Because it's in physical bus sharing, it's not gonna let you do it. So what you're gonna have to do, and this is where it gets complex and why RDMs are kind of a nightmare to manage is let's shut down number two, first of all. We'll shut down one. And then before we move O1, what we should really do to O2 is go in here and delete that RDM disk because it's gonna be otherwise pointed at the wrong, it's gonna be looking in the wrong place, right? So this time we don't wanna delete these files. Uh, again, it's not a big deal if you do, but because it's really a test O1 that kind of owns that file. Now we can migrate this to VMFS O2. And it's gonna give you a warning here, but it's still gonna complete. So now it's moved, we can power back on, and we can go into the settings of two and add that RDM back, which means existing hard disk. Look back at number one here, and again, pick that descriptor file. And then again, make sure it's on the right SCSI controller. I mean, there's just a lot of steps involved here, right? Which kind of adds to my case of why you should avoid RDMs if at all possible. Then we can power back on. So it's, it's a lot more manual, right? You can't just let uh, vSphere do its thing as far as DRS and, and move things around dynamically from a storage perspective. Um, let me show you one other thing I discovered and uh, it's kind of interesting. So let me edit this guy. Let me delete this RDM and I'm going to delete the SCSI controller as well. So now they're not sharing RDMs. Uh, I may have to do that in a different order. Let's see if it goes. All right, we'll do it to one. Well, that's probably gonna fail there. So let's remove this. We'll just leave it. And you know what, I'll just leave that SCSI controller there. So let's add RDM seven back. This time we'll do virtual. All right, so let's look at this one last time just to confirm. So it should have an RDM, it's seven gigs. Actually looking at Elon, yeah, I know, don't worry about that. Um, let's migrate this to a vSAN disk. So we'll change the storage, choose vSAN. Um, well, let me do it. I think I have to remove that SCSI controller first, sorry. There's too many scenarios to keep track of here. Oh, I know why. I have to shut it down to remove the SCSI controller. It's powered off. I can't, I can do it to two. So we'll add six to this one. And we'll do virtual. All right, we'll power this on. So this will fail, that's okay. All right, so let's migrate to, from VMFS to vSAN. So this time I'm not gonna play with this. I'm not gonna specify thin or thick. So it should in theory just move the descriptor file, right? But it actually converts it. I really have no option here other than to probably power it off, remove the RDM, move it, and then reattach it. And I think that's because VM, or I'm sorry, vSAN is just 
built-in provision. There's no way around it. So you're kind of specifying that unless maybe you created a policy where it was thick, but I, I think even then it would still convert it. So um, that was just something interesting I noticed. So again, it's, it's tricky, right? And there's no, nothing called it out and said, hey, we're gonna convert this RDM and it's gonna become a thick uh, VMDK, right? So just a heads up there. Um, as far as cloning, so if I were to clone this, let me see, what do I have attached to this one? So I have a seven gig actual RDM. If I clone this, it's going to convert it to a VMDK. Um, I can make it a template, and when I deploy a new VM from that template, at that point, it will convert the contents of the RDM into a VMDK. So lots of scenarios, lots of unknowns here, right? Lots of lots of confusing scenarios and situations. Um, let's say I actually did want to convert an RDM to a VMDK, which I actually just did on Testo2 here. So if we look at it, because now it's on my vSAN data store, this is a VMDK. Let's say I actually wanted to do that and get away from RDMs. The next step, of course, would be because this was the six gig one, is we would want to go back to our storage array and probably take that six gig LUN offline. Uh, I wouldn't delete it right away probably, wait a week or something like that. But just as a reminder, always go back and clean up these LUNs. You don't want them sitting around because it's gonna get real confusing real fast, right? Um, Let's see, any other scenarios I forgot to cover? There's, there's so much here. I think I just about covered it all. There's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of room for opportunities to make mistakes, that's for sure. So that's why I tell my customers, let's not use RDMs if we can get around it. So I think that was pretty much all I had. Um, let's see, all these links up here, this is a good one. It's a little bit old. Uh, but it just covers some of those scenarios as far as hot migration and cold migration and things like that. Um, this one explains the differences real granularly between physical and virtual RDMs, right? What the differences there are. Um, this is just some good documentation straight from our vSphere docs. And you can pick the version that's relevant for you as far as, you know, connecting RDMs uh, and everything that goes along with it. Uh, here's a good doc about how to migrate RDMs to VMDKs specifically as it relates to Windows Server failover clusters or Microsoft clustering services. So uh, if you're, you know, you have a bunch of SQL clusters and you can't move to always on uh, technology, right? SQL clusters, and you need to keep these as traditional failover clusters, um, there may be an opportunity to actually get rid of RDMs if you're on vSphere 7 and the array, the array supports it. There's a couple other caveats there as well, but um, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to get away from RDMs. This is again talking about that uh, perennially reserved option, right? And then this is a blog that kind of talks about that new functionality for marking all those perennially reserved uh, settings for each one. So I'll include all these links in the video when I get it up on YouTube. Um, and then just a reminder for all the TAMs on the call here today, or I'm sure most TAM customers know what I'll be talking about here. Um, the TDM tool or TAM data manager, which TAMs leverage to collect metrics from customers' environments, it now has in the latest version 2.5, uh, the capability to show whether or not VMs have RDMs attached, which is fantastic. So Zach, who's been kind of chiming in here, uh, kind of spearheaded that and made sure that that was uh, a new feature. So thanks for doing that, Zach. I think that'll help for sure from a migration perspective. It doesn't show how many RDMs or what the size of those RDMs are, but it does tell whether or not there is at least one RDM attached and should help you kind of identify those unique workloads as you're trying to migrate. So, Yep. And Good. one thing I'll add on that topic is uh, if if you're looking at your environment with with your TAM and if you see that basically the entire environment is using VMDKs with the exception of one VM, that that one VM might be something to double check proactively just because it it may be you know some one-off favor that was done for somebody a couple years ago when people lost track of. 
and and it might be good to to confirm is that actually still needed is there a way to do a proactive migration of vmdks as as steve said maybe the the functionality of vSphere has, has uh, matured enough that that rdm just wouldn't be necessary yep that's all I got. So anybody got any questions or comments, feel free to unmute or put it in chat. All right. Well, then I will give you back about seven minutes. Thanks for joining everybody and have a good rest of your week.